Hello and welcome to Health Matters on Channels Television. Thanks for joining us. I am Mary Alale Yusuf. The global figure of confirmed COVID-19 cases has gone over 9.8 million by June the 27th. There were more than 4.9 million recoveries, representing about 50% of all confirmed cases all over the world. Sadly, though, more than 490,000 people have died, had died by that time. In Nigeria, within the same time frame, there were over 23,000 confirmed infections, about 8,000 people had recovered, and 554 people had died. In Lagos, figures were close to 10,000 and still about 42% of all cases in the country. My guest is Deputy Director of Research and at the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research and Head of Infection Control and Biosecurity. He's also a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist. Dr. Gregory Ohihoi, you are welcome to the show. Thank you, Mary. My pleasure to be here again. Let's start with a bit of uh, remedies, shall we? Now, we heard about three herbal remedies some time ago that were validated and approved for further evaluation. That was the language. Can you explain to us what it means to be validated? That's a very good question, uh, Mary. You know, I'm a scientist, so I will talk from the perspective of a scientist and not a politician. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there are standard measures to get a medication validated. It's a very long process. And as a scientist, the only known way to validate a medication is to conduct clinical trials. Which involves people. Yes, which involve people. So clinical trials and go through phase. It's a very long process normally. And they're trying to speed that up now for the COVID-19, for the case of the vaccine. So I, I am not um, a supporter of those validated medications because it has not gone through rigorous scientific process, because there's something about medications you must understand. There is aspect of safety, which is very important. So that is to say that the medication may be efficacious, but not safe. So it could enough. be toxic. Even so it could be toxic. Working. So you, you don't um, want the solution to be more than a disease. That's one. Two, and there's, there are many ways to prove whether a drug is even efficacious, even if you've established uh, safety. You have to be sure that the results you are getting may not be due to chance. And you have to go to rigorous clinical trials you know, statistical modeling and, and inferential statistics to be sure beyond all reasonable doubt that this medication, you know, is both safe and effective. For many candidate medications that go through clinical trials, you may, you may start with a, a thousand or even 10,000 before you can get one. And resources have gone into that. So I think we should leave all this shortcut mentality to find solutions to our problems and do what is right. If we're using all these methods to solve our problems in the scientific world, we wouldn't have had solutions to malaria, to measles, to polio. So we must do the right things at all times and let the science do So in other words, go the normal, slow and easy yes. and sure way. And the sure way. Is so that, that what happened with thalidomide? You know, there was the time that there were thalidomide babies, the famous thalidomide babies, yes, good. If who I, came without limbs. Exactly. That's a very good question. That is even a, a medication that even went through rigorous clinical trial. And so we along there. If you have different phases of clinical trial, you have phase one, phase two, phase three and phase four. So along the line, after using that drug for a while, they discovered that the drug had very detrimental effect, you know, to the unborn child. And, and you saw the effects. You know, a lot of uh, litigation, court cases, and you can't even quantify the lives that we've lost and the permanent, you know, debilitation that the medication had done. That's why we must be very careful before we start rushing to say that the drug is efficacious. We must allow the science to lead, and we must go through the rigorous process that is free of bias, free of politics, free of sentiments. I think that's the way to go. But in your opinion, these three remedies that have been spoken about, what stage are they at? Uh, I'm not aware they're in, in any stage, to be honest. Um, I, I don't think they have gone through the process. First of all, you have to do what they call proof of concept. Mm. Proof of concept is even a tough process. You have to show that what you are claiming the medication can, it can even do it. Because remember that before medications get to clinical trial, there's even the preclinical phases. That's right. Where they have to do, you know, animal, and true animal tests, that's clinical trial. There's even what they call... Nowadays, what they call the computer, computer in silico studies. That means after you, you test it outside and you use computerized mechanisms and algorithms to prove that it's efficacious, before you now move that medication to the clinical phase. Then from the clinical phase, even the preclinical phase, before you even get that, because they, you can also synthesize some tissues in the lab and test that particular medication on it before you now move into the clinical trials proper. But so it's if, very rigorous. If a, a vaccine has been tried on, on animals 
and is found not to be toxic in animals. Is it safe to say that it won't be toxic in human beings? Not necessarily, because wow. there are unique things about But it's, it's good news for a year that is not toxic in animals that are like human beings, you know, that are close to human beings in terms of their physiology and okay. their nature. Many times we use what we call non-human primates. Even the AIDS vaccine that they've been trying, they tried it at first in non human primates. That's why monkeys are our friends. Yes, yes, so, and, <laughs> and they got some results. But when it gets to particular, there are many medications that have succeeded at that stage, which is so close, as if it will work in humans and it's still fail in humans. Wow, that means. Yes, it, and there are medications that one succeeded. One should really work. You know, yes, that carefully. worked in phase one clinical trial. You know, you prove that it's safe. That's, that's safe, um, phase one clinical trial, it proves safety. Then you go to phase two, and at phase three, some medications still fail at that stage. Wow. So, I mean, you never know. There are drugs that have been withdrawn from the market, even that is after post marketing now. The drug has been accepted, has received, you know, the regulatory approval. If in the case of the US, the FDA in, in Nigeria, looking at NAVDAC. So, and, the, yes, features, and, yes. the features of stage one, two, and three clinical trials, are they all different? Yes, because you are trying to achieve different things. First of all, in phase one, you're using it in, in classic cases of phase one. You're using the medication, for instance, in people who really don't have the disease. They're healthy volunteers. And that phase, you are trying to prove safety, safety first. Then in phase two, you're looking at a few population of people to prove efficacy. Then you are, in phase three, you're using a bit of a larger cohort, you know, to be able to see whether there are other side effects that you may not see in phase two. Then after you get approval, after phase three, you know, you may get an approval. You have to look at what they call post-marketing surveillance and even phase four to see whether long-term usage of these medications will give rise to side effects. But in the case of clinical trials for vaccine, is a bit different. That's for medications because you know that vaccine, you have to do what they, that's what they call a vaccine challenge. In a vaccine challenge, that's the fastest way you can do it, but it's also it's dangerous. In, in, in the normal way, which is the non-vaccine challenge way, is that you, you give the vaccine and you allow the and assume that the person, by being in the community, may be exposed to the infectious infectious agents and see whether the person will build antibodies and these antibodies are neutralizing antibodies and we're able to do the job. But you have to also find out how long mm. these antibodies will last in circulation and be effective. That's also another factor. But in a vaccine challenge, which is quite dangerous, we have, and it has an ethical clause to it, that is you, because you are under pressure to want to prove that this vaccine works, so you, you expose deliberately the, the volunteers to the um, COVID virus in the case of COVID-19. You expose them deliberately, you get them exposed, maybe healthy, young people who you know will not come down with very severe diseases. Okay. So you intentionally expose them. That's what the vaccine challenge, and you, and you now give them the antibodies. After you give them the antibodies, you intentionally expose them and see whether they'll be able to, you know, fight start, off the disease. Off, which is dangerous because it can, we can come back with untoward effects. You know, that's not really the best way to do it because of um, the ethics involved in it. But if in, in desperate situation, you want to do that. And I think some groups are considering that to go through the way of a vaccine challenge so that they can prove the efficacy of the vaccine, you know, within the shortest possible time. And, um, and they're looking at, some people are looking at, um, you know, early next year. Mm. Initially, the group in Oxford are looking at in the fall, looking at September. Yes, how is that going, know, the Oxford-based um, group? Well, for some time now, the Oxford group, they've been silent. I think the last report I got um, from them is that they are, they are feeling as if where people should not be so enthusiastic, you know, because these things can go either way. Maybe you may see promises they're initially. They're feeling a bit rushed. Yes, and you, at the end of the day, you not, they don't get what you want, you know. But there are two good things that have happened in the research so far with vaccine. One, they've seen that there's neutralizing antibodies. Yes. So that's good news. So they have to also look, uh, give it some time to see how, uh, if, even if there's protection, how long, you know, with the protection the, last. last because that's Maybe also for important. a lifetime yes, or a few or years. Or what dosage do you need to use? These are things that will take time. Because the flu vaccine is every season. Exactly. So these are things that... But there's history behind them. You know, this is... The coronavirus is, is a novel coronavirus. There are other cousins of, the, of this novel coronavirus. So they can look at what they've experienced from the cousins of yes. this coronavirus in vaccine development and use that knowledge to be able to, uh, you know, uh, predict how this will go. But everything seems to be rushed, and it makes sense for us to rush it because time is of the essence. Okay, let me ask you about the Madagascar queue. Mm. I read that it has something called artemisia, you know, mm, yeah. sounds a lot yeah, like artemisinin. Right. Yeah. And then our own hydroxychloroquine trial is, has, like, has um, uh, chloroquine. Mm. So is this COVID-19... A cousin to malaria, please tell us. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very reasonable question to ask. But unfortunately, um, it doesn't work that way. Mm. 
-hmm. It doesn't work that way. Now, for both um, the Malagasy tea, which is antimicinin based, which we use for as an anti-malaria, exactly. a lot of drugs that have you know antimicinin. There's no evidence that it's it a solution. Cures yes, there's anything. no evidence. And even for the chloroquine, there's still no evidence that chloroquine is effective. Some countries have dropped, you know, pursuing the chloroquine um, trial because they've not seen anything, not seen any benefit. Some preliminary reports have reported, um, you know, very devastating side effects, particularly cardiac side effects in the individuals. Thankfully, we are doing ours in Nigeria. We will see what we'll find out from I hear it. of complications with pregnancies too. With chloroquine or with the COVID? With, with, the, with the Madagascar cure. Of course, because it's unproven. It's okay. unproven. And that's the danger of just um, using something that you've not taken through the rigorous process of clinical trials or even rigorous process of research. Clinical trial is even um, giving it so much credit. It hasn't gone through the preclinical stage. They've not shown us um, you know, um, in vitro studies to show the efficacy of this medication. They've not shown us in vitro studies to show the, better the not safety. Be them on They've not shown us studies in animals. You know, they just, it's just something that they feel you know, will work and um, is getting solutions. This may just be, uh, at best, anecdotal experiences okay. that people may so, have. So now that we're talking about pregnant women, I know that you are an obstetrician and gynecologist, so you have a heart for pregnant women. And you have noticed that they're getting less attention, you know, during this COVID-19 COVID time. What are you most concerned about when it comes to pregnant women in these times? Yes, good question, uh, Mary. I'm really worried. My greatest concern this season has been the collateral effect of COVID-19. Tendency for people to neglect other aspects of care. And being an obstetrician and ecologist, I'm particularly worried about the pregnant women that you know, people may not give them needed attention. They may have reduced the number of antenatal visits they need to have. High risk patients will not get the necessary attention. Um, when, pregnant, when pregnant women come down with symptoms that simulate COVID-19, uh, people may think they have COVID-19 and abandon them. So I'll just say that I've looked at WHO guidelines, you know, and um, uh, practice guidelines for pregnant women is that nothing much has changed in terms of the fact that pregnant women should attend their antenatal visits as regularly as required. And then when they attend the natural visit, they should keep to their routine medications, keep to their routine care that they need to have. And pregnant, pregnant women, when they have symptoms that simulate COVID-19, they should not be denied care. These are some of the guidelines that WHO has Now, let emphasized. me ask you a question. If a pregnant woman comes to the hospital for a checkup, probably she's a high-risk person and she has to have a scan. That's, there's, a, there's contact. Mm. If she keeps to the guidelines of washing her hands, mm. not touching her face, wearing a mask, and, well, social distancing with whoever she has to be distant from, of course, she can't be distant from the doctor, so he can be wearing his mask. If she does that, and the doctor does his part of keeping himself neat and clean and everything, shouldn't she be okay? Yes, if I don't just for a pregnant woman, for everybody, like I keep telling my colleagues, you know, I'm happy that I'm not just a researcher, I'm still actively practicing. You know, if a, if a patient has COVID-19, somebody will have to manage the patient, and that person is a doctor. So we can run away. So I think the responsibility is for us to make use of our PPEs. The responsibility is upon the government to provide the PPEs for the doctors to use. I mean, it's not, I mean, we've managed infectious cases before. We've dealt with Ebola, you know, we've dealt with other infectious conditions. The important thing is to keep to the universal precaution, use your PPEs. Um, and make use of everything that you need to use, and also ensure that the woman protects herself also. So you can't deny somebody care, irrespective okay, let of me pause pregnancy or that, or not. We will know, come yes. back and continue because we are going on a break now. Stay with us till the break is over. Welcome back. We're talking about COVID-19 in conjunction with vaccines and hospital visits, especially of pregnant women. If you have any questions, you can call 0805-468-3514. That's 0805-468-3514. It's on your screen now. You can also tweet at CTV underscore Mary A. I think we should actually be talking to the doctors because people have spoken of pregnant women who were abandoned by doctors. Nurses, they run away. When a woman needs help and is obviously pregnant, it's not just a fever or a stomachache, it's a pregnancy. And that baby is not going to wait for anybody. I, I, think, I think it's doctors who should, be, who should be addressed. 
how do you how do you talk to a doctor and make him feel safe to attend to anybody who comes? Anyway, in this um, period of COVID nineteen, there have been very good stories of um, babies delivered. You know, successfully. Oh yes, we've heard those. Yes, yeah, so and they were delivered by doctors, but if uh, midwives, of PPE, and um, for example, nurses play their roles in it. So if, it's not as if it's every case. I mean, there have been the good side of it. There have been um, isolated cases of where you know doctors or caregivers abandon patients. I, I think it's. A, I think it's. A, there's a level of ignorance to that. I've heard of yeah. places where doctors and nurses improvise, mm. where they don't have you know complete PPE. Can that be done here? Well, if that is possible, fine. But these PPEs can be made available. When we talk about PPEs, people don't look at it as something that is utopian. You know, there are PPEs that, I mean, your, your face mask is, a, is PPE. That's right. Your, your face gloves shield, are PPE. Your visor is, a, is PPE. Your gloves are PPE. So there's a degree of PPE. So maybe it's just that suit. Yeah, yes. So, about. of course, you know, it's not, I don't expect government to provide the complete PPE suit for every caregiver. Let's be honest with you. That's not practical. It's not going to okay. happen. Because they cannot afford it. Even in other But of course, you have to course. triage and stratify risk. Okay. Okay. If a, if a patient comes and the clinical picture in front of you, of course, you have to go with your universal precaution. You have your visor, you have your face mask, you have your hand gloves for everybody, irrespective mm -hmm. of the patient's presenting something. And you have your apron. It's what you call the basic apron yes. that we all wear. I mean, in my opinion, that's enough for you to approach, you know, a patient. But if you are using the N95. Mask, mask, which gives a good degree of protection. So people shouldn't just be scared. Just the three pie mask. So people should not be scared. But if you now discover that from your interaction with this patient, I'm trying to be very pragmatic about the approach now, so not just to speak about it from a distance. If you now realize that the risk classification for this particular patient is high, so subsequently, if you want to see that kind of patient, if you want to scale up your PPE, if you want to go with a few suits, or if a patient comes in with history that is highly suggestive of COVID-19 from the, from the get-go, from you have yeah. that picture, so you suit up completely with your PPE and go in there. But I mean, I don't expect the, uh, the, uh, the government or whoever is sponsoring the PPE to provide full suit for Everybody, it's not, it's not, it's not practical. But they can't just do that. But isn't that? But the where... basic PPE that you wear, like your mm. apron, your visor, or your or your face shield, or your face mask, or your hand gloves, and uh, is enough to give you a, a decent degree of protection, even if you are managing a patient that has COVID nineteen. COVID nineteen. Is isn't that a, a good uh, argument for for us to start considering actually having? excuse me, yes. what we call a family doctor. Because somebody you visit all the time, maybe you have a hospital or two you visit, someone you see regularly knows when you're acting off, knows when uh, this isn't usually how you behave. And then the index of suspicion is more accurate. Or what do you think? You see, the way patients present, it, it could be heterogeneous. You know, for instance, if a patient comes in, a patient is not so ill-looking, Patient is fine. Yeah, I mean, you won't be that apprehensive. But if a patient comes in, a patient is having respiratory symptoms. A patient is having fever. Let me I pause mean, you. you. So you'll be worried. Let me pause you and take Israel. Hello, Israel. Yeah, hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. What's your question? Uh, okay. I, I, I just want to find out why is it that all the time, whenever we're having the challenge of health challenge in Nigeria, that is when the doctors go on strike. And the issue of these uh, pregnant women not being taken care of during this uh, season. I, I don't think it's fair enough for uh, our, our society because it has caused a lot of, uh, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to put it, but uh, it's, so much, it's sad. Israel. Thank you. And that is why we are having this program to sensitize people that don't be scared. See your, see your patient. You go to the hospital if you're sick. If you take precautions, then you should be fine, right? Absolutely. That's the point that I think we should go for both the caregivers and the patient. If you do the right thing, if you use your universal precaution, see every patient as, as patient that could potentially have COVID-19. So there's a minimum um, set of PP that you must use. Like I said, I'm emphasizing No again. matter what the Yes, case. you know, at, at, during this season, you, I mean, you must see every patient with your face mask, you know, N95 preferably, your, your face shield or a visor, and you must have a, an apron and a pair of gloves for all patients, irrespective of what you're doing for that patient. And as you stratify risk, or if there's an index of suspicion, of course, you can go the full PPE, you know, as, as needed. But the, the point is that no patient should be denied care Let's quickly because take of Ifain. a suspicion of COVID-19. Yeah. No, no patient Let's should be denied care. Let's quickly care. take Ifain from Abuja. Hello, Ifain. Hello? Your question. 
Hello? We can hear you, if I Go ahead. Yes, I so much appreciate this program. And your guest is really hitting the point. And uh, I must confess, uh, listening to him, listening to what you are giving me now, I'm so relaxed and so happy about this. Giving full details, full information about the COVID-19 pandemic and the issues and how the guidelines we should observe. I really like this. Keep it up, please. I love Lagos. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ifain. And you call just to just to comment on that. Well, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> He's loving you. <laughs> anyway, so um, let's go to a completely different type mm. set of people. The ones who don't even believe there is anything like COVID-19. Why do we have these people? Why? What's happening? It's the level of penetration of information and the, the level of uh, knowledge they are pretty for. I don't want to judge them. Uh, for, you can sit from your eye seats and look at people and say, why are they behaving so ignorantly? But it's, it depends on the level of penetration of the information. For instance, you know, if I put myself in a position where I don't have any relative who have suffered from COVID-19, <laughs> don't have any relative. I've just seen an example. It's, yeah, I, 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 I understand. I don't have anybody but... who has died from COVID-19, and they're talking about it. It will seem so distant to me. But if you've had relatives, you know, like I've had relatives who have had COVID-19, who are very ill. That's my own personal story. I've had friends and colleagues who have died from COVID-19. So to me, it's very weird. So I, I won't, it's difficult, but I think the responsibility is upon us, you know, media houses, government. To keep pushing Yes, to push the, the information to their level. Don't Let's speak, quickly don't take speak over their head. We have to push information to their level. I'm and make sorry to butt in. Let's yeah. quickly call Tony. Uh, get Tony on the line. Hello, Tony Delta. Are you there? Hello. Thank you, madam, for putting me on the line. I'm so grateful for coming to this program. You're welcome. And um, I'm happy the way you are busy dissecting this issue. Um, but let me also say something. You see, personally, I feel that in Nigeria, we've not been pushed to actually with the health system. Anytime there is an outbreak of any pandemic, we immediately see our health personnel running on screen, shouting here and there. The only time we've had uh, this issue of sudden health crisis at Egypt is this pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, actually. We are all going to go back to our various countries and die by World Health Organization. People had to lock their borders, who had to impound uh, uh, life that actually came in and all that. The question is this. Our doctors go on strike. But if our doctors go on strike any time this game. For me, it's not really proper. And these are some doctors who have private hospitals here and there. And at the end of the day, the question is, are they really out there for the health of the masses? Or they? We have taken your point, Tony. Thank you so much. Uh, the doctors have called off their strike. Exactly. At least that's a good thing. Yes. They've called off their strike. But please, please, people are saying, listen to us, think about us you know, before you take off on a strike. And also the authorities, yeah. let's make sure this doesn't yes, happen Yes, true. I think again. that's what you just took it from me, that you see, it's a two-way thing. They should not look at the doctors alone. They should also look at the people who are responsible for taking care of the doctors. You have to look at it from both sides and ensure that the doctors, I can tell you, don't want to go on strike. Mm. There are reasons that they go on strike for. So I think we have, our doctors are leaving the country, they are droves. So we should do everything we can to keep those to who keep decide them to in. stay. You know, and encourage them and empower them. And in fairness to the doctors, during the strike, they insisted that those that were managing the um, COVID isolation ward, that they should stay, stay back, which back. was very magnificent. Magn On that note, doctor, I have to call an end to the show. Thank you so much for coming. It's been very engaging. And thank you so much for being there for us and for your calls, Israel, Ifani, Tony, and all the viewers. Now, um, you can call this number if you have symptoms of COVID-19. If you live in Lagos, these are numbers to call. Now, there is a hotline, an NCDC hotline you can also call. There it is on the screen. And please feel free at any time to go to channelstv.com slash podcasts to enjoy an audio version of the program. If you missed it, are commuting, or just want to listen all over again. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful day. I am Mary Alaleus.